Hello and welcome to the first Lee Academies Trust Showcase Professional Development event. This year we have decided to include a different element to our Trust PD offer that recognises our most important resource, you, the teaching and support staff. We appreciate how tricky it can be to make time to watch other teachers in the classroom and we know that often the best learning comes from watching others model good practice and having the time to discuss ideas and strategies. With this in mind, we are aiming to showcase talent across our trust by providing a window into classrooms that you might not always get the chance to see. Please use this designated Trust PD time to watch our showcase. Ideally with colleagues from across your department or key stage. Use what you see to fuel discussion and support reflection of your own practice and explore how we can learn from each other's successes. Following the showcase film, you will be able to join a question and answer session with one of the staff who have contributed to allow you to learn more and hopefully to ask questions of them to challenge and support your own development. The first showcase is based around the idea of challenge. Thank you to those academies and staff who so willingly volunteered to be part of this first film. Here in the lesson that I was teaching today and that I've talked today, we've been focusing on trying to build reasoning skills and the ability to question and debate mathematical concepts. And today it's as simple as factors and multiples. I've presented to the children a task in which is very open-ended and I've tried to remove myself from as much of the conversation as possible so that they can start to debate numbers and use their understanding of uh, multiples and factors but more than anything, it's about how the children can challenge each other um, and can also approach tasks in an open-ended way, not to say this is the definitive answer, but here's the answer that I've come to. What have you done differently? And at Oaks, we conference. So rather than explicit marking, we've also dis we've tried to make sure that the children, we fostered a love of children, love of learning in the children so that they question each other, they discuss problems with each other and that's throughout the curriculum. But particularly here in maths in year five, we know that developing problem solving and reasoning is huge. So the lesson is an open-ended opportunity for children to have a go at a task, which is a bit of a mystery to begin with, that starts to unravel when they notice trends and notice themes throughout the maths. So I hope you enjoy it today. Thank you. Let's think very carefully about some of these problems that we have. We were discussing how many representations or ways we can work these out. So we have four, which are quite basic questions, aren't they? Hands up if you found them easy to work out. Was there a particular question there you found challenging? Jasmine? This question here, number three. George, which is it for you? Uh, number four. Number four, okay. Anything different for you, Oshin? Okay. Now, what was it about question number three, Jasmine, that you found challenging? Squared. And can we clarify what squared meant? Can we clarify what squared meant? Nina? It means you can't something by itself. Okay. And what's our most common mistake we make? What do we say when we get squared come up? We always see this happen. Kaylin? We times by two. So if we remember, this comes up in bid mass as well, doesn't it? Where does it come up? And what, which part of bid mass does it come into? Jase? Indices. OK. So let's just talk about some of the basic answers we've got. Now, I'm going to ask you first for the way you've worked it out, and then we're going to talk about the ways that you worked it out, because there's different versions. So question number one, please. Maisie? Um, I've got 27. You've got 27. Now, hands up if you've got the same answer. That's, that's what we call unanimous, isn't it? Everyone's come with the same answer. OK, now what I'd like you to do, without looking, or actually we're going to close our eyes. Everybody close their eyes. You're going to hold up the amount of fingers for the amount of different ways you think you could work that out. So I've now held up my fingers. I think I could work it out in this many ways, this many representations. And I can see some of us are doing the same. OK, open your eyes. Hands up if you held up more than one finger and you had more than one way of working the first question out. I see a few hands up. The reason for those hands, why? Can you start your sentence with, I agree or disagree, Nina? Um, well, I... Zero, isn't it? Okay, now, here's our challenge. 
We're going to revisit number five a little bit later on. But I'm going to give you all a puzzle. I'm going to say nothing to you at the moment other than asking you the following question. I say following question using a stem sentence. I notice. Have a look at what you have in front of you. I'm going to give you three minutes to conference, to discuss, to talk. What is it that you notice? Three minutes, go. What I would like you to do now is we are going to use our observations. Now I have given you all a section or segment of a problem. What I'd like you to do in your books is to write the word at the top, or the words I notice, and then bullet point every single thing that you notice, no matter how big or how small you think it is, about this pattern or these colours or these numbers. So everybody needs, Darren, I notice. Just those two words, and then you tell me what it is that you notice. There's no right, there's no wrong. What have you noticed about those numbers? Okay, go deeper. Which different colours? When do they appear? Oh, so some are split. So you could say that. I know that some numbers are split. Some numbers have different colours. This is what some people haven't yet had the chance to see. Now, you may not have realised, but here we have up to 20. Here we have up to 20. Here we have up to... And here we have up to 10, 5 or 20. Now, this means that the sequence continues. And does this therefore, this table, does this back up some of your ideas about what should be coming next? So can we all come to the same conclusion that these are factors? The colours represent factors of, num of the numbers? Okay. Well, what I want to see from you is... We are going to try and figure out the next 10 in the sequence. You are going to try and figure out the colours that represent them and how they should be structured. Oh, Maybe six will be green with a line, and then 10 will be, five with a line, and then 20 with a line, and then 30 with a line, and then 30 with a line. You need the next 10 in the sequence. We are up to 20. You do not need to draw your circles any larger than what they have drawn. But you do need to be able to explain and justify your choices because the next step is we're going to go beyond 30. We're going to continue and see if we can figure them out. Okay? So I'm going to give you the next five to ten minutes in order to work through and have the next ten in the sequence done. You will have to conference. You will have to look back at patterns. You only need the colours that they have used so far. I'm going to be working here and here. You have 10 minutes. If our red numbers are prime, why does two not appear as red? And I heard some people say, two's not prime. So which side of the fence is it that you sit? Do you sit on the two is prime? Or do you sit on the two is not prime? Hands up if you're on my two is prime. Okay. Hands up if you're on my two is not prime. Hands up if you are agreeing with this side, but you have an explanation as to why two may be orange and not red. Your hand should be up. An even prime number only goes into one and two and no other. It only has two factors, one in itself. However, the factor itself is a really common times table, the twos. Sam, could you exp expand that, please? How is seven counted? Okay. Oh, th there's a good point, because Jay said that reds are our prime numbers. But we're already missing a prime number here, a prime number here. Is there another prime number that's currently missing, Oshin? Number five. Number five. So is the pattern a little bit more um, detailed and in-depth than we first envisaged? Why have we got twos in orange, fives in 
blue and seven's in purple. Who can explain that? Who thinks they know why? Why is it that 13 and 11 and 17 appear red? So therefore what we need to see now in our work is, we need to see that. This table, hands up if you've given an explanation as to the colours you've chosen. Kana, could you read it out please? Could you just, could somebody extend that slightly? He said because purple is seven and green is three. But also, green's here and green's 18 and green's nine. So let's just do our sevens together. Seven, seven, seven 14, 14 21. 21. So you're not going to get to 22. So Maisie said we can't do 22 there. Okay. So we're still agreeing orange, but we're not sure what else. You think red and yellow? Well, yellow is supposed to be like four and Okay. But therefore you're still saying red. Oshin, did you disprove that it shouldn't be red? Okay. What is it that you notice now that we didn't notice beforehand? Uh, apparently, red can be in numbers. Mm. So, when Lottie was aspirational and said 22 should be red and orange, she was correct that something's changed. Something else has changed in our pattern. What is it? Something else has appeared on there that wasn't there beforehand. What's there that wasn't there before? Look closely. What do we think they might mean? Ah, without shout. What do we think they may mean? I've got 11, 13, 11, 17, 23. What may that mean, Nina? It means the numbering of the times is 2, like 2 times 11. Ah, so it's picked out a prime number that was initially red, 11, which we said, we were unsure, we said, do we disagree or do we agree? Then it said orange, red and 11. So that means what? What's the, what's the calculation there? Two times. Two, times. Two times 11. But it's made sure it's put the 11 because it's got 13 here. Why is 26 orange, red with 13? Tom? times 13. And these numbers are all what, please? Ollie, what's this number? What are all these? They're all primes. Ah. So when we come back in from break time, our challenge is that we are going to try and see how far we can extend this pattern up to 100 as soon as we are back in. Okay? Schools, academies, they're places where scholarship should be highly celebrated and every child needs to have that access about how to achieve when it comes to their own scholarship, when it comes to having an appreciation and an understanding for learning. Horace Mann said that education is the great equaliser, that education gives everyone in society that extra, that step up. And whilst we know there's loads and loads of challenges in uh, depending what type of family you're born into, uh, what your personal and social economic circumstances are, our job as teachers is to, to teach people stuff and teach them enough stuff to keep those doors open for them for as long as possible. So what we try to do here at Lab and what we all try to do in every single school across the Trust is, as teachers, keep doors open for our students as long as possible so they can go and do whatever they want. And one way that we're doing that here at Lab and across our Trust schools is really focusing on rigour, content. Subject knowledge is really highly valued at Lab, as I'm sure it is at all of our schools. And middle leaders have a real huge part to play in that, as well as senior leaders, to ensure that there is dedicated time to development and enrichment of subject knowledge. And teachers also have to take that level of ownership about understanding about where that lesson fits within the scheme of work. So it's a really powerful thing to do is to zoom out of your lesson by lesson plan and look at the whole holistic picture of what is in the scheme of work and what that entails. Whether that's looking at the whole five year journey that your students are on at your school, looking at a key stage or looking at a specific um, scheme of work within your subject areas. A, a robust curriculum is dead important as we discussed, but how do you make that curriculum engaging? So one thing that we've done here at Lab is we've looked at our cohort and where appropriate and where possible, we've ensured that, that our curriculum reflects what our cohort actually is. We're an inner city school, we're in South East London in Greenwich. We, our feeders primary schools are from Charlton, Woolwich, some in Blackheath, some in Lewisham. So we have a really diverse background and it's vitally important that our, curric our curriculum 
echoes that. So in subjects like art and English, they've made sure their texts that their artists that they study are, are, are diverse. And where you have that freedom in key stage three, that's really, really important because that ultimately and automatically makes those children more engaged with what they're learning. So we've really dedicated time to, to ensure that our curriculum is diverse. We launched our inset with it this year. We ensured that there was um, time given over to staff about how they can ensure their curriculum is diverse. We have really lent into things like Black History Month, LGBT History Month, etc., to ensure that we are showing a representation of who our community is and what they're seeing. There's nothing more powerful than seeing yourself or seeing someone who reminds you of yourself in what you're learning. Just the way like it's really powerful to see a representation of you on TV or in screen or in a book. The same thing, the same logic exactly applies to what's happening in school as well. We've also dedicated a whole set of research sessions for a research group to, to encourage diversity in our curriculum as well. By ensuring that you've got that really robust, rigorous and diverse curriculum, it's really, really then a lot simpler to identify the powerful knowledge and enable us as teachers and planners of schemes of work to ensure that there's conceptual links. And that's really important, coupled with that subject knowledge, it, to, to help those children link what they're learning, not only within their subject from lesson to lesson, but also across subjects and really getting that multidisciplinary factor. So our CPD programme at LAB has been really, really important um, to ensure that we're looking at how scholarship can be um, up front and centre. And I said scholarship isn't just about smart kids getting smarter or the smart kids just using LAB as a launch pad for university only pros career prospects in the future, but also ensuring how our SEN students and our lower attaining pupils can really, really thrive here as well. The love to learn and how you like push yourself and how you drive yourself to learn. There might be a few people in the class that like like to study really hard because I can name at least three people in my class that like to do that. So it's better for them because if they rush it or they know it really easily, there's always something for them to do and to push themselves with it. I think that scholarship is um, taking an extra step to uh, learn something more about a subject. So like, for example, if I really like DT, I could uh, if I really wanted to, I could learn more about DT. You know, how, how is this happening? Why is this happening? Like, when I put ice cubes in a Coca-Cola, why does it fizzle up? And with science, you know, it, it answers my questions. For me, they, they bump me up grades, and right now I'm in grade three. And it's just, it's just exploring, like, more vocabulary, more in-depth Spanish. I have a nice teacher. Her name is Miss Aixabel, and she pulls me out of class. And right now I'm, do, I'm doing like a project, like last module, I did a slideshow on what, uh, what kind of uh, country I'd want to go to, and I picked Japan. And I had to research all about that um, at Japan, but I had to put it in Spanish. So I had to like write loads of paragraphs in Spanish. So one thing that we've made sure that we've really highlighted is um, looking at the attainment gap and really understanding that a huge part of that attainment gap is a vocabulary gap. The access a lot of our disadvantaged students have to that high tier vocabulary at home is sometimes limited. And we've had dedicated CPD to ensure that the vocabulary gap is reduced. And English plays a huge role in that, but every single department has a huge tranche of vocabulary that's vital for success in their subject areas. And we make sure it's a matter of habit that we really, really look closely at that sort of tier two and tier three subject specific vocabulary in our subject areas. By throwing yourself into digital strategies, by learning from each other about what you can do in lessons, outside of lessons, it was a godsend during lockdown, as you can imagine, that our students already were equipped with these devices and fully aware of how to utilise them as well as staff. But what it really, really does is it provides a level of psychological safety for a lot of our students. It means that they've got an extra port of call to, to, to call on when it comes to getting help, particularly for those low attaining students. So earlier I mentioned about how we dedicated a research group to diversity in the curriculum. We've actually also researched a research group for, um, dedicated a research group for um, lessons learned from lockdown and retaining those elements of remote learning that actually are really beneficial, particularly for those SEN students, to level that play field, to give them that psychological safety, to ensure that they can progress. And we found real success in this. So whilst we might have a bit of an attainment gap with our HAP students, and that's something that we're definitely going to be working on going forward, our SEN students are doing incredibly well when it comes to performing because of that tool that they have, because they've got that extra, that 
extra piece of help. And that's a really great thing for them to use with their um, um, LSA support. And, and if there's not always opportunity for LSA support, they can also get those differentiated resources as well. That timetable has really helped drive improvement and the kids get that instant gratification from feedback and that helps them stick in that scholarship, that scholarly mindset going forward. And also helps massively with their ambition because they want, they know how to get better so they want to implement that straight away rather than reading something from weeks and weeks ago. The tool of uh, Google Classrooms, as I'm sure we're all aware now, is, is being incredibly useful in lockdown and lots of schools were doing that before lockdown. As I mentioned we have a virtual classroom for every physical classroom and that's provided a massive uh, a crutch for everyone during lockdown and coming back as well. Another thing that we've tried to do here is utilise Google Sites which um, so we've ensured that every subject has a Google site that is a, comp a, a, a treasure chest basically of, of your subject, of lessons, resources, knowledge organisers. It's student facing and it's parent facing as well. So that means that it's got to be tip top shape and regularly updated. But what a Google site does is it gives the opportunity for uh, a resource bank to help drive scholarship. So we can have extra tasks posted in that. Uh, summer projects, Easter projects can all be utilised in that as well as ensuring that, so for example, an example that we did in science at lab was we did a virtual careers fair where we got uh, speakers to, uh, to record um, what they did for a job in an interview setting, in a really informal setting for students to understand about uh, uh, what, what science could lead to. Another great thing that we use Google Sites and Google Classroom for was to post things for our Lab Lit Festival, um, which we promote every single year as, as we have a really rigid amazing uh, dedicated we have a really amazing dedicated um, reading program here at, at lab where every lesson starts of reading and and the, the google site and the google classroom has really helped promote those in a setting that allowed every teacher to to present that today we're going to be looking at a year 10 lesson we're going to be focusing today on atomic physics it's a Blue Review lesson which allows me to, to focus on the misconceptions that pupils have and to close those gaps in knowledge. In this lesson I will be building in some Key Stage 5 knowledge. Uh, that is to help build the, uh, the resilience of the pupils, it builds their curiosity and it helps them to, to aspire to go on to, to take A-levels hopefully or take Key Stage 5 uh, Applied Science and continue on in either careers or STEM related subjects going forward. Right, so good morning. What we're going to do today is we are going to be looking at the atomic structure section from your PPE. So um, that part, we're going to focus on that bit today, particularly on the areas that we were making mistakes in, any things where we were either had misconceptions or just couldn't quite recall certain bits. There are areas of this part where we did okay in, and I want to try and stretch us a little bit further and push us a little bit harder on those parts as well. Once you've written, nice and quiet please for me, once you've written the date, title and LO, can you get out your uh, Chromebooks for me? And on there is a very quick Google quiz to see if we can recall. There is a very quick Google quiz to see if we can recall the properties of alpha, beta, gamma radiation sources. So today we started debating about atomic physics and the different type of radiations, for example, beta particles, uh, alpha particles. I think it can be used in the medical field. Um, for like um, x-rays and stuff like that. Um, also, there's dangers that come with um, the particles, so we need to be aware of those. Everyday life, there'd be radiation. Like, it isn't just in specific jobs. There are always things that you're around that have radiation. So just knowing at least the basics of it and what it can do and precautions that you need to take can actually just help you in everyday life, um, like not even just depending on your job. When you look at, for example, chemotherapy and radiotherapy, they use a lot of radiation to cure and help fight the cancer cells in your body. Yeah, definitely benefits, go on. Um, I think there are benefits to it, but they all are dangerous in their own certain way. Um, with the, in the medical field, with the x-rays and stuff, yeah, they can help us to learn and break down uh, tumour cells and stuff. Um, it also increased the risks of develop uh, because the ionising of the cells increased the risk of getting cancer. Almost kind of reels us in as well. She 
does these videos with songs behind them and which we actually care about and she makes us care. Okay, now we're going to quickly look at this last bullet point in a little bit more detail. We're talking about particles being deflected by electric fields. So what I've got for you is this very wonderful diagram. What I would like you to do for me is I would like you to uh, sketch the diagram. Just a sketch, please. Just a sketch. Also, you know when we speak about the ionisation, yeah. ionisation is um, what that happens is they can cause mutations in the DNA of a person's cells. Alpha, beta and gamma are all ionising, so all three of them have a chance to cause mutations to a person's cells. Alpha is the most ionising, so you've got a higher risk of that. Gamma is the least ionising, so there's a smaller risk. It wouldn't give a person cancer, but it increases the risk of a person developing cancer. And then it wouldn't. It unfortunately, it won't make you the Hulk. It would not make you the Hulk, unfortunately. It did for Bruce Banner, but he was a, a special case. Right, Jason, that's, a, that's different because you don't have alpha, beta or gamma radiation in your phone. Your phone uses microwaves to work. And there are, there are different studies. There's, it's, I don't know if there's an actual conclusion entirely, but the, uh, the microwave radiation from your phone can, it does increase the body temperature of the area it's close to by sort of like a bit of a degree. So it's not a massive difference. What we don't know yet are the long-term effects of a person keeping their phone in their pocket, potentially near their genitalia, their reproductive organs. We don't know the effects on male or female reproductive systems entirely. <laughs> right, what you're gonna now do for me, you've got the diagram sketched. I am not gonna help you with this part. This part is you are gonna be able to use your own knowledge. You are gonna be able to use the notes we made at the start of the lesson. So from our starter, we made a few notes after that quiz. You can use that, you can use your own brains. You're gonna do this first part by yourself. So I'm gonna give you, um, let's, say, let's say three minutes. I'm gonna give you three minutes by yourself to explain why do alpha particles move like this when they pass through an electric field? Why do beta particles move like this? And why do gamma particles move like this? Why are they moving in those three directions when they pass through an electric field? Any questions? Okay, if you get to look, let me know. Now, there is uh, one more thing I want to talk about briefly, and this is not anything you need to know for exams, but it's really good for understanding uh, why we get a change in the uh, intensity of radiation as we increase distance. This links into key stage five. So this is, uh, this is some stuff you will do at A-level, and it links in um, to biology as well, particularly with things like intensity of light when you look at photosynthesis. Um, it, it's those sort of ideas, those extra ideas behind how radiation works. What we're going to look at very briefly, you don't have to make any of these notes, is just something called the inverse square law. The inverse square law. Am I good to go on yet, Harry? Mm. Yeah? Now, this links into the idea we spoke about the radiation spreading apart. So if we go back to here, we said the particles, basically they can spread out, they don't go in a straight line altogether, they're going to spread out uh, as you move further away from the source. And this links to something called the inverse square law. Now, what is actually happening, and mathematically the way this works, is if you have your source of radiation, and let's just say that distance there was one metre. We're going to call it R, because we link it to a radius, because what's going to happen is the radiation is being emitted all the way around, not just in one direction, as a, as a sphere. So this is the radius of our, of our sphere for the moment. If you are one radius apart, and if we just assume for the moment that is one metre, so let's just assume that R is one metre, you get a certain amount of radiation. If you double your distance, so you go from one metre into two metres, so 2R is two metres, the intensity that you detect, whether it's radiation in terms of alpha, beta, gamma, whether it's radiation in terms of uh, electromagnetic radiation, so light, heat, those sort of things as well, what happens is your intensity will be, so your intensity, will be 1 over 2 squared. What's 1 over 2 squared? 1 over 4. If I now triple my distance, so I'm going to go 3R, so I'm now going uh, 3 metres, my intensity will be, it will, go, it will now be 1 over 3 squared. What's 1 over 3 squared? 1 ninth. One ninth. So every single time you increase your distance, your intensity doesn't go down by the same amount. If I double my distance, 
the intensity goes down by four. If I triple my distance, my intensity goes down by nine. And so on and so on and so on. Just because I know some of you have been asking me about this before, when we actually look at these decays at GCSE, all we need to know is this much here. We don't need to know any more than what's going on here. In reality, at A level, at degree level, what you look at more is you look at things called neutrinos, and there's also more things involved in these, in these um, emissions. So what will often happen is when you get a decay taking place, this is looking at a beta decay, so it's releasing a beta particle. We've got our electron here. We also get our, in this case, an anti-neutrino. There was also a case where you can get a, a positron, which is an antimatter electron, and you get a neutrino. So there are other particles involved that we don't need to know about just yet. So at GCSE, we don't need to learn about anti-neutrinos, neutrinos, and so on, but it's just because I know these, these words crop up quite a lot in the news. Neutrinos a lot. Um, if, have any of you seen the film 2012? No? They basically blame neutrinos for the end of the world, and it's, um, it's a little bit ridiculous. Yeah. It is, um, do you know Dara O'Brien, the comedian? Does Mock the Week? He's got a really, uh, I recommend, he does a really good sketch. Um, you'll be able to find it on YouTube straight away. If you put in Darrow Breen, 2012 Neutrinos, um, he does this massive rant about the film and how it, ridiculous it is. It's well worth a watch. We discovered that our pupils were struggling with their writing, in particular when they were asked to write a piece of transactional writing for a purpose. This was particularly for things such as writing a letter, a speech and an article and we wanted to ensure that we developed it to make sure that their writing was much stronger and much more convincing. The previous writing frames and scaffolds that we used were definitely appropriate for ensuring that our pupils achieved a grade four but we really wanted to challenge them to ensure that they moved up the mark scheme and were able to get much higher grades. That led us to developing the writing project, something which we believe will ensure that they can develop a more compelling and convincing tone and piece of writing. One issue that pupils often face was their ability to use a range of different ideas. Quite often, pupils ended up repeating themselves and their writing was extremely boring and laborious. To... This led to us developing the acronym HELMET, which stands for Health, Education, Legal, Money, Environment, Technology and Social. This acronym provides pupils with a range of different ideas that they can consider when they are posed with an argument that they have to write about. For example, our pupils may be asked to write a letter to their local member of parliament asking to present their view on the development of a local sports centre. They could, for example, talk about the health benefits, physical or mental, to engaging local people in exercise. They could potentially talk about the social benefits of bringing a local community together. And they could potentially talk about the economic benefits, the benefits in terms of what it might bring to the local economy, but also the costs that are involved in such a major project. Not only does using the HELMET acronym help pupils to engage in ensuring they have a range of ideas in their writing, it also ensures that they engage in the all important planning process that we know helps pupils to structure their writing and leads to a much more effective piece at the end. All of this is then supported by a writing framework. This writing framework is used to present pupils with things such as expert sentence types or negative and positive complex vocabulary to enable them to sound far more sophisticated when they are writing. It definitely sounds more sophisticated to say that the Secretary of State for Education supports the proposals or, for example, that you're looking at something from an economic perspective. This makes their writing sound far more realistic and gives them an assured tone when they are developing their writing. Embedding this project into all year groups and their writing in lessons has led to great progress. Most recently, we engaged in the No More Marking project, which is a national scheme looking at the writing ages of children in year seven from the start of the year to the end of the year. On average, pupils made one year of progress in terms of their writing age. Pupils at Stations Crownwoods Academy made one year and 11 months of progress, which is phenomenal. And we put that down to engaging with the writing project. And we really do think it's transformational in ensuring that children can structure their writing and leading to a really confident tone when they are developing that. In today's lesson, you're going to see one of our great practitioners, Maggie Efford, teaching a year 10 class. 
Now this year 10 class are already familiar with the basics I've talked you through today in terms of the sentence starters, sounding like an expert, the negative and the positive vocabulary that they can incorporate into their writing. Today, Maggie is going to take that a step further with them by introducing them to the more challenging concepts of ethos, pathos and logos, something which we are doing to stretch and challenge our pupils beyond the typical aphorist techniques that you might see in normal writing. Right, OK, can we make sure we're getting the key question down in your exercise books, please? And then, based on this statement, parents today are overprotective. They should let their children take part in adventurous, even risky activities to prepare them for later in life. I want you to write helmets down the side of your page and then think about any arguments that you can use um, to respond to this statement uh, with the headings health, education, law, money, environment, technology and social time. If you can't remember what those are on the sheet in front of you, you have got those headings. OK, so very quickly for me. Think about if any of them might lead into other things. So there might be ones that you want to connect together as well. So quite often uh, you might have a point that you want to make about education and then that might also have some financial implications as well that you want to talk about. So combine them together. OK, lovely. I'm going to say we've had enough time on that. Hopefully all of you have come up with some ideas. You don't have to have them for all of them, but it's just a nice way of refreshing your memory on using the writing project and helmets to help you with your planning. So. Um, before we move on, I'm just going to ask if we can go through just one idea for each of them. So, uh, Patrick, did you get anything for health? Yeah, go on. What argument could you make for or against this statement uh, in relation to health? OK, so taking your own risks and, and experiencing different things educates people on, um, you know, how to behave later on in life or things that they might want to pursue. Lovely. Now, today, what we're going to do is we are going to do something that's a bit more challenging, OK? So we're going to have a look at uh, formulating an argument using the concept of ethos, pathos, logos, OK? So ethos is going to formulate your first paragraph, and this is the one we're really going to focus on today, OK? So with this, it's about establishing your authority to speak about the given topic, OK? So to make an argument based on who you are. So what makes you an expert to talk about this topic, OK? And then the next paragraph to develop your argument would then be pathos, OK? So this is developing your ideas by making your audience feel something, OK? So... Um, make them making an argument and using those powerful emotions to convey your points all right so you would then use pathos for your developing your argument in your second paragraph and then your third would be logos okay um which is all about developing your argument right um by using logical arguments okay so you're going to use reason to um, convince people that your opinion is the one that is right, okay? So ethos, pathos, lo logos. And we're gonna be looking specifically at ethos today and challenging you to see if you can come up with a really effective paragraph in establishing your tone and your voice, okay? So um, this is a sample exam question. Uh, for English language paper two, OK? So it, as you have with the starter activity, there is a statement that you have to respond to. So all sports should be fun, fair and open to everyone. These days, sport seems to be more about money, corruption and winning at any cost. Write an article for a newspaper in which you explain your point of view on this statement, OK? So what I've done for you is, based on that question, Right, about sports being fun, fair and open to everyone. Um, I have written out a plan. Okay? Now, this is what your plan might look like. So you'll see there the ethos of this is I'm going to say in a previous life, I was a PE teacher. I wasn't. 
but um, I'm going to say that I was, and then actually now I'm a sports journalist, okay? So I am best placed, that is my ethos, I am best placed to write about this, okay? So um, I'm going to say that I'm also a lifelong football fan and I coach a Saturday team as well, okay? Those are my experiences that are going to allow me to write about this and have the authority on it. Because previously, our planning may have looked like, right, I'm going to write a paragraph entirely on health, okay? This is challenging you to blend those ideas together, okay? So that's what we're thinking about doing, challenging ourselves to blend them together. So what I want you to do, based on the statement that you used for the starter activity, I would now like you to plan with a focus on just your ethos, okay? So we're only planning that, openings, that opening paragraph, who are you, right? Why are you the authority to speak about this? And what elements of uh, helmets are you going to use in that paragraph, okay? And I'll come around and help you while you're doing this. I'm going to give you five minutes to do that, okay? Off you go. Now, what I want us to look at now is how I would then write this, okay? So my model answer is based on the statement that I planned for. So not the one that you've done, but this is an example of uh, what I would like you to produce. I think that the example paragraphs on the board show what a perfect answer would look like and something, it's something to strive for when, you, when you're writing, you can look back up and see what, you, what techniques and whatever you've used. And the helmet sheets you gave us show you how to structure your Work. In a former life, I taught PE to secondary school aged children. It was the best job I have ever had and probably ever will have. Subsequently, I feel best placed to consider that at its core, sport has always been the great equaliser for those who are disadvantaged. Anyone can pursue their love of sport with a bit of hard work and determination, regardless of their socio-economic status. Sport has always brought joy to those who have participated in the experience, either by taking part as a player or by supporting their team. But now, as someone who writes about sports for a living, I know, I know lucky me, I get a front row seat to the corruption that is destroying the integrity of the sporting world. More and more, there are decisions made that defy the values that, as a teacher, I tried to instill in my students. In recent years, it seems the more profit that can be made from a sport, the more it attracts corruption at the highest levels. You only have to look at Qatar's successful World Cup bid to recognise that fairness has been thrown out for financial gain, and with it, the fun too. Previously, Often, I, I find myself sport asking, education is a behaviour Through all these experiences, I found that it is those who have a limited structure set by their parents that found themselves in trouble with the law more frequently. Leading human rights lawyers in the UK have urged the importance of parents setting rules for their children. Fantastic, that is an excellent opening paragraph.